And then there were four. Nigeria, South Africa, DR Congo, and Cote d'Ivoire. If those are one of your teams, congratulations. You are now 180 minutes away from being declared African champions. I, I envy you. I congratulate you. I take my hat off to you. Uh, hello and welcome to another episode of the African Five Aside podcast. My name is Maher Mizahi. I'm your host. And this podcast, as always, is brought to you by AfricaZaCountry.com. Let's talk about the final matches of the quarterfinals of the 2023 African Cup of Nations. We had Mali play against Cote d'Ivoire in Bouaké in the early match. And then in the later match, we had Cape Verde play against South Africa and Yamoussoukro. Me personally, I'd rather focus on the first match, the early match, because I think that's the match that most neutrals were watching. It finishes 2-1 to one for Cote d'Ivoire in Bouaké. And the fact that this was played in Bouaké was special. Uh, today on the website, we had a piece up by Alistair Howarth, and he was talking about, you know, just explaining the history of the city, how this was a city that was held by rebels, that was very symbolically uh, indicative of separation, of segregation, of division in Ivorian society. But then they go and they light the flame of peace in the stadium, and it becomes Stade de la Paix, the Stadium of Peace. And Didier Drogba wants to take his Ballon African Ballon d'Or there. And for, you know, the Ivorian society to get behind this Ivorian team after that big win against Senegal. I thought it was special that the match was to be played in Bouaké. Bouaké is also six and a half hours from Mali. Uh, it's a it's just a, a short drive, you know, and many, many Malian players have Ivorian attachments or Ivorian roots. In fact, Moussa Dumbia, who didn't play today, uh, he's born in Bouaké. Uh, Eric Sekouchel, the coach of Mali, born in Abidjan. Um, Yves Bissouma and Nene Dorjelas. Uh, two pivotal players in this Malian national team. They're Ivorian, born in the Ivory Coast to Ivorian parents, and they played for Mali later on. A uh, few people have asked me why that is. I'll touch on it very quickly. Both of those players go to play in the JMG Academy in Bamako, which is one of the best academies on the, on the African continent. These are the same people that really created the Mimo Sifcom Academy uh, for Azek Mimosa in Cote d'Ivoire and produced the likes of uh, Kolo Toure, Yaya Toure, Gervinho, um, Emmanuel Abue, I believe, uh, just Solomon Kalou, Bonaventure Kalou, practically the bulk of that Ivorian golden generation with the exception of Drogba. So they, uh, after a while, leave Abidjan, they leave Cote d'Ivoire, and they go to Mali, and now they've produced players like uh, Amadou Haidara, Diadje Samaseku, Hamari Traore, uh, and there are so many. And, and a lot of, I guess, Ivorians do want to benefit from that academy. And, and so when they go to play up there, I think... There's a little bit of influence that comes in from Mali and from the academy, and they, I think they tried to promote the Malian national team. And so that's why players like Bisouma or Dorjelas um, play for Mali. I think it's a sort of gratitude, it's a sort of reconnaissance to Mali for, you know, basically taking them in as their teenagers and giving them that professional career. Anyways, let's talk about football. Let's talk about the match. Before, prior to this match, we said that this was going to be a midfield battle, right? That these are two sides with the most possession of the ball, um, some two sides that make the most passes, um, and that it was going to be a very tight match. And that's essentially what it was. But I was surprised at how much Mali dominated possession, especially in the first half. Um, I thought the system worked to a T. You know, they play that 4-4-2 with the diamond four. And I remember I said... Um, Mali don't usually play short too often compared to Cote d'Ivoire who do try to play that first ball into Jean-Michel Sari or, or an Ibrahim Sangari. Mali tend to play long through Sekou Nyakate and that's what, exactly what was happening in the first half. They, they were giving Cote d'Ivoire a lot of trouble because of the directness of their play. Um, case in point, um, Nyakate hits a long pass for Lassine Sineyoko who gets the better of Odlan Kosono who tugs him, pulls him down and uh, and Mali win a penalty, um, deserved yellow card. Adama Nastroy steps up, and Yahya Fofana makes an absolutely splendid uh, save. So hats off to everybody there. I didn't think it was a poor penalty, um, just a very, very good save. A note about the officiating before we continue, because prior to that penalty incident, we had another penalty incident that took six minutes to resolve. So eventually, it was ruled not a penalty because there was um, an offside. But again, it was indicative of many refs in this African Cup of Nations, absolutely relying on VAR. They're afraid to make the call. They'll just rely on VAR to to to, uh, to correct them or to tell them, hey, this is a penalty. 
and that's a big problem. You know, we want more assertive referees. And somebody like the Algerian referee uh, Mustafa Garbal yesterday, even though some people might say that the penalties he called were soft, um, at least he took the initiative and actually called them. Because everybody else, not everybody else, but a majority of referees in this tournament, and who have otherwise, by the way, done a decent job officiating. I think the officiating in this tournament has been okay. But there's still too much of a dependence on VAR for big calls in matches. And that is not good because, you know, an extra sequence of play could end in an injury or a booking uh, that ends up being a permanent record. Anyways, so 27 minutes in, I remember looking at my phone, checking the clock. 27 minutes in, it's all Mali. Cote d'Ivoire didn't really get their first real chance until the 30th minute, and that came through an Aurier free kick and a header. Um, Mali continued to dominate after that, though. Um, and what happens is uh, Jean-Michel Seri, who, by the way, we thought was going to be very sharp on the ball, and that we thought that was uh, a good element to add into midfield because he brought, he brought balance, you know? He had a very up-and-down game today, and he gets caught with the ball under his feet. Kamori Dumbia, the 20-year-old who has three assists in this tournament, uh, does a great job of nicking the ball from him, giving it to Lassin Sineyoko, who I think nutmegs Odilan Kosunu. He tugs him down. Second yellow card. Second yellow card sent off. And Odilan Kosunu is a player that he received a lot of plaudits for his match against Senegal. I think for good reason, you know. Um, but he had a very, very bad first half. Um, and he nearly cost his side uh, the match. The resulting, uh, or the result of the free kick wasn't much. Nas Traore, uh, he struck it well, but he struck it wide. At half, Willy Boli and Sebastian Aller come on, and it ends up being a 5-3-1, and then one out of possession, and then a 3-5-1-1 in possession. So they're just relying on the fullbacks to go up and down and up and down. I thought Mali, you, you know, it's a tricky situation when you're up a goal, or sorry, you know, it's a tricky situation when you're up uh, a man and you're kind of searching for a goal, but you don't want to leave yourself too exposed. And I thought Mali did a good job of uh, striking that balance, um, not being complacent, but the problem was they were not creating much either. Throughout the second half, Mali, even though they scored, they only had an XG of 0.15, so they were not creating nearly as many chances as they, sh as they should have been. Um, I think Eric, Eric Sekushela noticed that, and that's why he brought on Nene Dorjelas, who, by the way, what a goal. What a goal. And for him to score that in that game in Buake, uh, you know, only storylines that you can get in football. Nene Dorjelas, born in Yopugan, by the way. That's where a drug bug grew up as well, for, or spent the first six years of his life. Uh, to Ivorian parents, uh, grew up, you know, playing football in Cote d'Ivoire. Goes to Mali at a very young age. Uh, chooses the Malian national team. One of the most... Uh, outstanding talents that Mali have, especially from the wing positions. He gets the ball on the left side, sits his big brother Frank Kessier down with a beautiful dribble, gets his head up, and one of the nicest curling efforts that we've seen at this tournament. Um, what a goal, what a moment, how fitting for this AFCON, you know, this diverse AFCON with so many different communities, um, Mali and Senegalese, Burkinabis, how fitting for that storyline to, to take place in this match. Um, after the goal, you know, I thought, it was over. I think most people thought it was over. Cote d'Ivoire were not creating much except for set pieces and corner kicks. Um, and it wasn't until the 86th minute, I don't know why he waited this long, that Emrys Fai finally throws on Simon Adingra. Because against Senegal, even though Cote d'Ivoire were controlling a lot of the match, you know, after the first 20 minutes, it wasn't until Simon Adingra and Sebastian Aller came on that they won that penalty that Nicolas Pepe won. Um, and it, they created that chance. And those two in particular, you know, they have great target play. And Adingra provides something that none of the other wingers can. He's, his movement, the way he cuts inside, his interplay, his uh, initiative, he's just so, so good. Um, and so for him to come on in the 86th minute, I was like, what is what is Emrys Faye doing? That's too late. But it wasn't too late. He just needed two minutes to, to score a goal. And he, he does it by, again, picking up the ball on a wing, cutting in. Uh, and just his the sheer determination to, to pounce on a loose ball and toe poke it in. Wow. That's another great moment for another great young player, uh, Simona Dingra from Brighton. Um, surprisingly enough, I thought after Adingra came in, and even in the minutes prior to that, Cote d'Ivoire were playing better with 10 men than they had been with 11. Um, Sebastian Aller hits the bar in the 97th minute, um, and I wrote down Cote d'Ivoire playing better with 10. Uh, and Mali, they couldn't create anything. It's, it almost seemed like they were playing for penalties, but 
Husseini Diabate was very wasteful. You know, he was subbed on and put on the right wing, and he just kept trying to cut in and cross, and it was the same thing every time. Um, the only real, I thought, dangerous player was Nene Dorjelis, um, but he was doing all of it on his own. Um, and then finally, you know, with one minute to play. So, so they scored the equalizer in the 88th minute, and they scored the go-ahead goal in the 120th minute. I mean, Cote d'Ivoire. <sighs> um, it's a corner kick. Seko Fofana, the ball bounces out to him. He hits it with his left foot, and then Umar Diakite flicks it in. And absolute pandemonium. Uh, I remember prior to the Senegal match, I was talking to Jonathan Wilson from The Guardian, and he told me, this team, they're like zombies. You just can't kill them. And it's so true. It's so true. I mean, <laughs> how are they here? I, it doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. And I was watching this match in a fan zone here in Abidjan, in Trashville, um, and man, the reaction from people. Everybody was celebrating. People were breaking plastic chairs, throwing chairs in the air, whistles, vuvuzelas, throwing water, throwing all kinds of beverages. Well, I mean, just such a great atmosphere. And I'm happy that the host nation is getting the <laughs> is getting the happiness they deserve, even though, you know, they're probably stressing their fans a lot more than the fans want to be stressed. But this was an absolutely massive win for Cote d'Ivoire. Um, this was always a match that I thought was going to be tight and that I thought they would win just because of their intangibles. And that's the last point I'll make about them is mental strength again. They go down early to Senegal, and I thought, ah, after losing 4-0 to Equatorial Guinea, this could be a place where they capitulate, they fold, they collapse, and game over. But no, they climb themselves out of that hole, they play better than Senegal, and they win that match. And now this one as well. You're down 1-0. Uh, you have a red card for 75 minutes. You're playing with 10 men. Uh, maybe even 80, 80 minutes you're playing with 10 men. Nobody really thought that you could win that match except for, except for the players and the team. It, and the mental strength for them to come back from that, my hat's off to, to the Ivorian national team because Emers Fai, the coach, he said when he took the job, the first two days of training, he said, were almost solely focused on getting over mental barriers and mental blocks and re-giving the confidence that I had in my team, basically. He said, I wanted to re rediscover my elephants, you know, my players, my elephants. And I really wonder what that consisted of. Was it speaking to a sports psychologist? Was it watching old matches and saying, like, look how good you guys are? I, I would like to ask him uh, that question in a future press conference if possible. But what, what, did, what did those two days consist of? What did you guys do exactly? So that's it. Cote d'Ivoire are on to the next round. Now they play against DR Congo in Ebimpe, in Abidjan. Um, <laughs> and they're, again, 180 minutes away from being champions. Who would have thunk it? As for Mali, <clears throat> Mali, you know, prior to the tournament, <clears throat> excuse me, anybody that watches the AFCON, we know that they're perennial dark horses, right? And, oh, maybe this is the year, maybe this is the year, maybe this is the year. And this year we thought maybe this is the year again. And they were playing good football, and under the coach, they have a great record, but they always find a way to disappoint you when it comes to this stage of the tournament, the quarterfinals or the semifinals. They've only made it to one final before, if I'm not mistaken, in 1972 with Salif Keita, and they never live up to the billing. So despite the fact that they win, you know, youth tournaments uh, at a high level, we need to find out what's wrong with Mali when they get to these crunch stages of the AFCON or World Cup qualifying, they never make it out. So that's something to, to be discovered and to be pondered on uh, after this tournament as we do a post-mortem. Anyways, let's move on to the second match of the day, Cape Verde against South Africa. Uh, this was another match that we thought was going to be very similar in styles. These are two teams that like to play football. They play those 4 3 threes. They like to keep the ball on the ground. Um, lots of overlapping runs, lots of great interplay. Lots of diagonal passes uh, into, you know, a winger that can take on a fullback one-on-one. -on -one. Two very, very good goalkeepers. I picked Cape Verde because I thought, you know, I thought they were a little more efficient and impressive in front of goal. Uh, but today, despite the fact that they created clear chances, one man, <laughs> Ronwin Williams, uh, stopped them. So let's talk about the match. First of all, Cape Verde came into this match and they made two substitutions uh, for injury. So and fitness. Bebe came off and uh, Deroy Duarte came out of the lineup and Kenny Rocha Santos and Gary Rodriguez uh, were the two that replaced them. Two very, very experienced players. Uh, 
And in this Cape Verde squad, you do have a lot of experienced players, like Vojinia, the goalkeeper. He played in Cape Verde's first match at an AFCON 11 years ago, January 19, 2013. Isn't that crazy? Just 11 years ago, they played in their very first AFCON uh, fixture. And I think it was against South Africa, if I'm not mistaken. It might have been against South Africa. So you see how it all comes full circle. The goalkeeper, Vojinia, and the captain, Ryan Mendez, uh, two of the survivors from, from that match. Um, so anyways, I thought Cape Verde started the match hot, but maybe from the 10th to the 30th minute, South Africa had a really good spell as well, where they started putting on the pressure. They had the ball in Cape Verde territory, uh, playing great combination play, great one touches, you know, uh, balls between the lines, um, not really creating too much goal scoring opportunities either side. Uh, but they were both playing good, good football. And towards the end of the first half, Cape Verde had the upper hand. But in the second half, I thought Cape Verde really took over. And, and their combination passing has been such a joy to watch, you know. Um, you see how Morocco does that with the triangle, you know, the Unahi, Ziyech, Hakimi triangle. Cape Verde have triangles in different places on the pitch, but they have that, you know, with Ryan Mendez, Steven Moreira, uh, Jamiro Montero. On one side, on the other side, you know, you have Jovali jo Cabral, uh, you have, um, what's his name, Deroy Duarte, you know, have Kevin Pina, you have uh, lo lots of, you know, really good players that can play those kinds of combinations. And then you have, you know, the third man runs in this match by Cape Verde, Chef's Kiss. How many times, you know, two players are playing a combination and a third player just takes off and they find him and it's smooth and it's seamless. South Africa did it as well. But in the second half in particular, Cape Verde were much, much better. And I thought in the second half, South Africa resorted to more long balls. That was an interesting switch. I don't know if it was conscious. I don't think it was conscious. I think they were being played by Cape Verde. But they start playing these long passes to, um, what's his name? Evidence Makopa, to Mayambela. And in the second half, it wasn't effective. In extra time, we'll get to that. But in the second half, it wasn't effective, really. Um, whereas Cape Verde, when they played long balls, they were long diagonals. And... I, don't, I would like to see a statistic for how many long diagonals Cape Verde completed in this match, but I wouldn't. I would my over under would be ten eleven, really really good passes, really precise passes, and, and my last note about Cape Verde is that we've seen Bubista, their coach, out coach Rivitoria, highest salary on the continent, Chris Hutton from Ghana, who coached in the Premier League. Today I thought he was better than Hugo Bruce, even though South Africa won. I thought he was better than Hugo Bruce, so. What does that say about Bubista? Is he a very, very underrated coach that should be coaching a very top national team? Or is this just more of like a group effort, the players, the coach, the nation, the momentum, you know? Something to ponder and something to keep an eye on uh, the Blue Sharks, um, you know, in the coming international windows. So after the second half where Cape Verde dominated, uh, South Africa, yeah, like I said, resorts playing long balls and some long passes. Makopa, I thought, was a little bit clumsy, trying to control them or trying to play combinations. Um, and with the final opportunity of the match, Ronwen Williams absolutely saved South Africa. And it's a long ball to Gilson Tavares, who... If you want to see what a super sub-striker should look like, it should be Gilson Tavares. He comes on, he brings energy, uh, he runs all over the pitch, pressing. He only has... He knows he has 30 to 40 minutes, and he absolutely utilizes them uh, and empties his tank every single time. Um, and this time, you know, he takes the ball down perfectly. He hits it on the half volley. And Ron Williams just sticks out an arm. And, you know, it hits the post. My, my colleague Alistair was saying that it had an, uh, a 90% chance of going in, according to the XGOT. 90% chance of going in. I, th I think, honestly, it should be higher than that. I think that's 95 uh out of 100 times, that's in. Hell, maybe 97 or 98 out of 100 times, that's in. Ron Wen Williams, beautiful, beautiful man. Um, <clears throat> but then in early in this extra time, South Africa got back into it. And I thought Virginia saved Cape Verde in early extra time. My, there was that double chance where Mayambela had a chance. But he was, I think, a little too tight to Virginia. I think he did a good job, but he was a little too tight to the goalkeeper. And then Makopa with the header, uh, he headed it down a little too hard. Um, I'm not sure if it was going in, but Virginia did a good job to, to save it again. Um, the one thing I would say about Cape Verde in extra times is that they were very sloppy, especially Bebe. Um, he was not only sloppy, he was selfish. Um, at times trying to dribble through, you know, three, four players when there was a pass to be had. 
trying to take a, a shot from 30, 40 yards out when, again, there was another pass to be had. Um, they, were, they weren't precise enough, Cape Verde. Um, in South Africa, I just kept thinking, where are the goals going to come from? My Mbella is a decent striker. Makopa, yeah. <laughs> I think Bafana fans or South Africans are going to watch this and think I hate their team. I don't hate the team. I think the team is really, really good. I think they play great football. Um, I love the Sundowns connection. I love the football they play. I love Thibaut Mukwena and the shots he takes. Percy Tau and his creativity. Uh, Temba Zwane and his running. Um, you know, Tapelo Morena and, and everything that he does. Uh, I like Mvala and Kakana as a, as a, as a center-half duo. Modiba is one of my favorite players, even though he doesn't play in that, you know, inverted fullback role like he does with Sundowns. Mudao is another one, you know, like my friend uh, Valile said, responsible for Zahana being at this Cup of Nations because of how much he dominated him in the pre-tournament friendly. Ronwen Williams, goalkeeper of the tournament, and they play the ball out with their feet. I like South Africa. Don't get me wrong. I didn't think either side deserved to win today, and I didn't think either, either side deserved to lose. I think maybe Cape Verde deserved to win maybe by 51% to 49. But South Africa played well. I did think it was going to be a close game. I thought Cape Verde would pull it off. But South Africa played well, and, and I'm not mad at them going through. Um, so Cape Verde, I, you know, now they have they have a young enough squad. I think some of the older players, maybe the goalkeeper Virginia, maybe Ryan Mendez are going to in, retire internationally. Um, but I'm getting interested to see what they do with their coach, Bubista, and what they can do in World Cup qualifying. SA, they go play against uh, Nigeria. And for those of you that don't know the history of the African Cup of Nations and the history of African football, that's an interesting rivalry, you know, very political rivalry at one point in the late, in the middle of the 1990s. Um, but it's, it's, it's fun. It's really fun. There's a little bit of an edge to it, but it's really fun. So that's something that I think we're going to be previewing tomorrow or after tomorrow um, on this channel. So please keep it locked in. I hope you enjoyed this round of football. Uh, I can't believe we're already at the semifinals. Me personally, my tournament's going to be cut short. I'm traveling back to Algeria tomorrow. Um, but I will be keeping up with the AFCON. I will still be making podcasts. I just won't be at the matches or at press conferences. So maybe I'll have a little less in insight. But maybe at the same time, I'll have more time to properly edit these podcasts and give you guys maybe visuals, graphics, things of that nature. So thanks for watching. Keep, thanks for keeping it locked in. And I'll speak to you tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow.